Today we're going to install the bit setter from Carbide 3D. We'll start with the bit setter itself. For the Shapeoko XL or XXL like I have, you need to install the shorter 4 millimeter screws into the top holes here and here. Just get the screws started in the holes and thread it properly. Do not tighten them down yet as they will tighten down on the rail of the CNC. The longer screws are only used if you have the smaller Shapeoko 3. With the gantry moved to the front of the CNC to help with alignment, place the bit setter on the front rail. About four and a half inches from the right side is proper placement. Now you will tighten the two screws you inserted earlier to clamp the bit setter to the front rail and hold it securely in place. As you can see, my supplemental waste board is in the way and I can't access the second screw, so I will remove it temporarily. Whenever you move the gantry manually, remember to move it slowly so you don't induce a charge into the stepper motors. Now, with the MDF out of the way, I can tighten down the second screw. Here we are. Now you need to route the cable from the bit setter back to the control board. The bit setter is supplied with a cable that's long enough for the XXL. Since I will be moving my CNC soon when I upgrade it to the XXL, I'm just going to run it underneath the CNC. Here I'm grabbing the bit setter cable that I ran underneath and going to give myself enough slack to make the connection. Once I think I have enough, I replace the rubber band around the cable to keep it tidy. As you can see, there are plenty of electrical wires and cables to make a mess. I really do try and keep this organized, although it doesn't look it in this camera shot. I have added a JTEC laser to my CNC and its control panel mounts to the cover of the Shapeoko control board. The next step is to remove the control panel cover to gain access to the inside and make our connections. It's easier said than done with all of these cables and wires in the way.
Depending on your model of Shapoko, your motherboard may look different. You can identify your version by looking at the bottom left corner of your printed circuit board. I have version 2 point something, which includes a connection for the bit 0. This is the bit 0 cable. My laser plugs in right next to the bit 0 port, so I'm going to carefully unplug the bit 0 cable making sure I keep my hands in the way and hide what I'm doing from the camera. This short jumper cable is used to connect the small probe adapter board that will allow you to use both Carbide Create probes. One side connects to the control board, and the other side has ports for the bit setter and bit zero. Luckily for me, the connectors are created such that they can only go in one way. Therefore, it's impossible to get them backward. Next, it's time to snake the bit setter cable through one of the holes in the housing and connect it to the probe adapter board using the top port. It's labeled, so it's difficult to make a mistake. Now, I will find the bit zero cable that I disconnected earlier and connect it as well using the bottom labeled port. By now, you have a number of cables inside the housing. Here, I've decided to disconnect the two probe cables and snake them behind my laser cable so the probe adapter board can nestle inside close to the main control board. It doesn't get secured down, so be careful using your CNC in an earthquake zone. The next step is to use your two hands to do three things at the same time. While holding the control housing in place, place a screw onto the hex wrench and secure the lid back onto the frame. Here we can see that I finally learned to switch to the other side, so I block the camera less. Luckily for me, I'm ambidextrous, so I can be equally ineffective from either side. Once you have both screws in place, you can tighten them down. Once you have the housing secured, it's time to plug everything back in. The USB cable is on top and the power below that. Now I'm going to reconnect my laser cables to the small control board that's riding piggyback on the housing cover. There's one for USB, a laser control cable, oh yeah, and a power cable as well. Now let's look at configuring carbide motion to recognize the bit setter. After you initialize the CNC, it will perform a homing cycle. Next, go to the jog position screen and click set zero. Be sure you click clear all offsets. I missed this step the first time, so trust me, just click it. Move the gantry forward and jog the cutter until it's centered over the bit setter button. Back in Carbide Motion, you can click the Position text on the left side of the screen to switch to Machine Position. I had done this previously in my earlier attempt. Now click the Settings tab. In the Settings tab, 
Make sure the options match your machine and Z axis type. In the bit setter section, click Enabled and use current location. This tells Carbide Motion where the bit setter is, so it can return to this location to measure your bit length when you make changes. Now that the bit setter is configured and enabled, after each initialization sequence, the gantry will move forward and Carbide Create will prompt you to install a new tool. Once you click that your tool is installed, the router will move over the bit setter and it will measure the tool length. You still need to set zero with your workpiece. Most of the time I use the bit zero. I like to think of it this way. The bit setter tells the machine how much tool is sticking out below the router and the bit zero tells the machine where your work material is and how tall it is. Between the two, the CNC has enough information to carry out the cut operations and make tool changes while only needing to measure the tool length after each change. Here I'm doing a test cut in a scrap piece of wood. You can see where I earlier gouged a trough when during setup I forgot to click clear all offsets. This was a scary lesson. You can also see that I was used to connecting the second dust boot and start cutting forgetting that the router will move over to the bit setter. Today I've done this enough times that I've learned to keep the dust boot feet high until after the bit setter operation and to only install the dust boot when carbide motion prompts me to set the spindle speed. Advanced VCarve is a great way to test the bit setter as it requires a tool change mid operation. Without the bit setter, you have to save out two separate G code operations, but with the bit setter, you can execute it as one function. In fact, I now cut most projects as one long operation with multiple tool changes during the job. Once the operation has completed for the end mill that's installed, Carbide Motion will raise the router and prompt you to turn off the spindle. Once you click the button, the router will move forward, allowing you to swap out the tool for the next one needed. These dust boot feet are always getting in my way, but that's a topic for a future video. Once the new tool is installed, you then click the button and the router will move over to the bit setter and measure the new tool length. Now it's time to reattach the dust boot and turn on the router. The V-bit is installed and the advanced V-carve operation is beveling all the edges, keeping the bottom of the V-bit at the same depth as the flat end mill used earlier in the hollowing out operation. This was my first advanced V-carve test, so the depth was not optimized and there's considerable cleanup to do, but you can see that the two operations combined to make one very cool cut. And here's a finished example of a project that used advanced VCarve and the bit setter.